Hi, welcome to trailer video number one, Break the Light Barrier or Perish. The reality is world population is expanding and natural resources are not. Even renewable resources are limited by the amount of sunlight that falls upon the earth. And this has happened before. Easter Island had a flourishing population of 15,000. Depletion of natural resources, essentially trees, led to war and cannibalism, reducing population by 90%. Okay, and presently, it looks like the world governments are ready to go to war over the remaining natural resources. Everybody seems to be staging troops that, in the case of worldwide chaos, can grab at resources that are not their own, because in a world of chaos, no, no one's going to do anything about it. And this war is likely to go nuclear, leaving the survivors to live in a Deathlands style existence, or Road Warrior for the other reference. <clears throat> there are only two positive solutions to the human population problem that I could come up with. One is nonviolent population control, requiring worldwide cooperation of resources, etc., etc. And the other one is exodus. Okay, if we look at population versus resource, even if we were able to control birth rates and reduce the population to a reasonable number, the husbanding of resources would ultimately be assigned to a powerful central committee that all governments would have to submit to. And first, I doubt seriously that any nation or people would submit to the above. I mean, the failure of central planning is a historical fact. So humans are really bad at central planning. And the reason why humans are really bad at central planning is because the majority of people are poor decision makers. Look at how many marriages end in divorce. Look at how many businesses don't make it to 10 years. Okay, look at how many airplane manufacturers there were in the 1920s and 30s. Look how many there are now. Look at how many computer companies started in the 80s. And there's only a couple left. Okay, we do not seem to make decisions well. And you look upon your life, look back, especially if you're an older person like me, well, I'm kind of middle-aged, and I guarantee you're going to say, gee, I wish I knew things better than I knew now. Okay, and therefore, because the majority of people are poor decision makers, rule by majority has always been a disaster. You've heard the terms from, you know, like people like Ben Franklin. Uh, the reason why we have a republic or tried to have a republic is because democracies are basically tyranny of the majority. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. Violent thugs would eventually gain control to enrich and power themselves at the expense of everyone else. And if you look at the old Soviet system, the old idea of Marxism was ch championed by the intellectuals saying it's an awesome, great idea. And then when they got into the experiment a few years, the intellectuals said, hey, wait, this isn't working. We need to change. But Stalin wasn't going to have the power, so he took all the intellectuals and sent them off to the gulag or to be executed. Okay, and look at the, the book Animal Farm. It is a great example of that. So it will end badly. Even if everyone submitted and every government submitted and the Central Committee was benevolent and able to admit to mistakes and reverse bad decisions in a timely manner, we do not know how to manage a closed biosphere. Because when the population of the Earth gets very, very large, we're going to be limiting, coming to the limit of the capacity of the Earth. Okay, And in the 1980s or 1990s, they tried to put a limited biosphere together with a limited number of people. Both attempts ran into pro and the, the mission was to support eight humans for two years. This whole purpose of this would be to plan deep space expeditions, assuming that a starship would have to carry an ecosystem with it in order to be able to sustain a long, long, long voyage. Both attempts ran into problems including insufficient food and oxygen production, die off of many of the animals and plants, squabbling among the resident scientists, and there's a lot of management issues. People are poor decision makers. So even in the snowball's chance in heck that we could work together and work benevolently and submit to 
this survival, we're still a problem that all our eggs are in one basket. Extinction of the human species would only be one asteroid away, one supervolcano away, one plague away. And obviously, the next war is going to be the war to end all wars. And humans seem to love war. The only option is a 90% exodus. Take as much flora and fauna with us as possible without disturbing the ecosystem of the earth. Spread the ecological diversity to the stars. Therefore, if there is a problem on Mother Earth, we could take some species back to repopulate. Okay, and the ecological survival of the Earth will be better with a smaller human footprint, but not a smaller footprint through war. This will be a win-win outcome for everybody. But what, what cost? It'll require tremendous amounts of energy to move 90% of the earth, per population off the Earth. But E equals mc squared says there's plenty of energy all around us. But physicists have no idea how to get out of it because we are still mired in a horse and buggy thinking about physics. The way we think about physics is still 300 years old. And how long would the journey be? Well, according to the Biosphere 2 experiment, we can't do anything. We couldn't do a long deep space voyage any longer than two years. So two years is going to be the upper limit for what we know now. And present science believes that any, any travel to the stars is going to be slower than light. And there's a movie, Passengers, with Jennifer Lawrence and Chris Pratt, that asks a lot of questions about how we would do a deep space voyage. In the movie Passengers, the planet that they were trying to go populate, Homestead 2, was about a meager 60 light years away. And at half the speed of light, that was 120 years in space. That is impractical on so many purposes. Like, how can a starship with all the hazards in space survive 120 years when the crew and the, and the passengers are all in suspended high animation? And they're going through, you know, the, the very dirty part of the atmosphere. And that's what happened in the movie. They got struck by space debris, and that impaired the ship to the point where the ship was going to, you know, oh, I'm not going to give the whole movie. But then again, what if we run into, well, everyone's asleep on the ship, and then there's an alien race out there that just loves the taste of human flesh. Oh, great, there's a ship full of humans that are in perfect hibernation, ready for any kind of banquet we choose to have. So the question is, what are humans willing to endure when it comes to traveling to the stars? Well, Biosphere 2 is a starting point, so right now we have an upper limit of technology of two years. But how long before passengers go crazy? Well, suppose you're intrigued about the aspect of emigrating to a new world. What would be your pain threshold with regard to travel, time, and risk? Well, let's look at what historical emigrations have involved. Well, if we look at the Mayflower, the Mayflower travel time was approximately two months at sea and had a 5% mortality while in transit. And the west westward expansion of the United States using wagon trains, this is before trains, the travel time from coast to coast is appro again approximately two months with about a 10% mortality rate. So it seems like two, per uh, two months seems to be the uh, level pain threshold of people. Now when the trains dropped the travel time from two months to three days, western emigration exploded. And that makes perfect sense, because humans are more likely to try something if they feel it can be reversed, or it has low risk. So, you know, and you want to still be able to communicate with friends and family and tell them how wonderful the new place is so they're not worried about you, and you still want to have friends and family to communicate with. So, in the movie Passengers, with a 120 light year journey, that's just way too, 120 year journey, that's just outrageous. And but what, what about mutual aid and trade? How long are you willing to wait for a UPS shipment uh, from another planet, 120 years or two months. And what if a planet needs assistance? Let's say there is a species die off on the Earth, and we need to get uh, samples or specimens back from one of our sister planets to help repopulate the planet. Or what if there's a crop failure and we need, you know, seed to replant? Well, are we going to be able to sustain waiting 120 years for help to arrive? Or is two months might even just be outside of our pain threshold limit on that. Now, what are the people looking for assisters? I mean, what if 
you're on a planet and they say, oh, we have to go help our sister planet. We need, you help. We need volunteers to go on the mission. Are you likely to volunteer for that mission if it's going to be two months or 120 years? I think you know the answer to that. So, my friends, the light barrier must be broken. Human survival requires practical immigration and mutual support on a reasonable time scale. So travel time must be no longer than a few months. And in the movie Passengers, Homestead 2 is a meager 60 light years away. In order to achieve the journey in two months would require 360 times the speed of light. Okay, 60 light years is pretty much in our planetary neighborhood. Okay, rounding up then, just to give us a little bit of margin, we need at least 500 times the speed of light or we're going to face extinction. Yeah, scientists say, well, traveling faster than the speed of light is impossible. Well, if this were true, then we're at our peak now. Things can only get worse from here. You might as well just have a war and get this idiot, idiot human race over with. However, scientists have been wrong before. There's many examples in the video, Rule of Acquisition 7, Popularity is Not Proof, or Rule of Acquisition 29, Reciprocal Thinking Postulate. The key is that scientists don't really know what happens when matter exceeds the speed of light because their models go singular before the speed of light, or at the speed of light. Therefore, anything they say is really just speculation. But ethereal mechanics shows that the model for matter collapses when its velocity relative to the ether exceeds the speed of light. And because ethereal mechanics explains how it happens, a workaround is possible. The trick is to drag ether with you, just like you would do with the air in your car. Think, if this guy over here were going 120 miles an hour, able to get the horse up to that speed, he would be under a lot of discomfort with trying to exist with all the air coming at him at 120 miles, it'd be very uncomfortable, if not lethal. So in order to go 120 miles in cars, what we do is we put a canopy around it that drags the air inside the car with you. So relative to the air inside the car, you're not traveling at all. And that will be the idea of how an ether ship will work. It'll drag the ether with it, avoiding the problem of traveling faster than the speed of light and it will move the ether around inside that subspace bubble in such a way to provide artificial gravity and even controlled time dilation to a little bit. And in my opinion a thousand times the speed of light is going to be slow gear. And we're going to avoid space debris which was the problem in the movie Passengers by traveling outside where space is clean. I call that deep space. And what we're going to do is we're going to establish channels to deep space, just like in the islands. I'm sorry for my printer here, but I don't know if you can see it in the video. What we do is we dredge deep channels out to deep water so that large ships can come into the harbor and offload their cargo without running aground. And we would do the same thing. We would clear channels from where planets are out to deep space out here where there's minimal space debris and then channels back. Now, it might be the case that we're not actually going to clear debris, but what we're going to do is establish colonies along the way. They're going to keep track of all the space debris, and computers are going to calculate the, the trajectories to get through, to, mid, to go through all the debris at high speed to get out to deep space. Okay, that's another possibility uh, short of dredging, space dredging. But once we're in deep space, we're probably going to establish the bulk of our human colonies on the shores of deep space, so we don't have to do a lot of this dredging stuff. I mean, if you think about human populations on the earth, we live close to deep water. We live close to the oceans. Most of the people live near the oceans. So the conclusion, human survival requires 500 times the speed of light at a minimum. Mainstream science cannot deliver. It's become stagnant, more like religion, for over 60 years. And I'll show you why in the trailer video of T2, Popping the Science Bubble. For to learn more about ethereal mechanics, see the new channel intro trailer T0. And please give this video a thumbs up and tell everyone about it. Your lives may depend on it. You can support the ethereal mechanics project by subscribing to our Patreon account or site, uh, and where you'll see more uh, detailed releases, software, and other publications. Thank you very much.